Good afternoon, everybody. This is one of the most eclectic days I've ever been at in terms of papers, and I've tried not to disappoint with this talk. So to start with, this title has taxed my thinking as to quite what to do with it. You get asked to talk, you make up a title, and then the night before, no, no, the, a month before, you start to think, what shall I talk about? But I thought I'd start by putting my office up in the corner. No, this is Royal Holloway. This is Royal Holloway's main building, if you've never seen it. And unless you happen to look very quickly as you go down the A30 towards Camberley through a driveway, you don't see it. And this building was built in 1865 or thereabouts as a further and higher education college for women by Thomas and Jane Holloway. The first man was allowed in to do a degree in 1945, just after the war, and the first male undergraduate in 1963. So there's the history of the college. It's modelled on a French chateau in Chambassy, but it's built in Victorian red bricks, and 500 students live on the top two floors. But still, this is not a sales pitch. This is about the sound of voice I'm going to start with. And I'm just giving you a quick picture of a very crude voice production with a speaker into the acoustic domain, into the perceptual domain, listeners and speakers, of course, and then the brain being the feedback loop, certainly for the speaker, and possibly, if you believe the motor theory of speech perception, for the listener as well. But that's not what the talk's about. It's just to give us some, something to hang things on. And I'm going to take us back to the 12th century, so please get your medieval Latin out and check my translation. It's not my translation, it's Sigborn's translation. Robert Ross Tester was a scientist who wrote around 15 academic papers in medieval Latin on all kinds of subjects. It's one of these polymaths. One of them was called De Generatione Sonorum, in which he described the vowels of English. And he described them using these motions, and the motions are drawn on the right-hand side. These are the translations from the original Latin of him describing these vowels. And I was asked to contribute to this project, and I went along to a group of people with a pile of Latin dictionaries and two or three people on translation trying to understand this in the context of these. And what they said they were looking at were the letters. He was describing how you write it down. And I was listening to this, and if you read this carefully, this is actually describing three-dimensional shapes, not two-dimensional shapes. And it struck me that these are not the letters, or they might be the letters. They are, in fact, vocal tract shapes. So we can take those letters, turn them on their side, and then here, start to create the shapes of human vocal tracts that he is describing that might have something to do with modern, well indeed, sorry, not modern, the vowels he was listening to. And there we have those shapes for those vowels, along with MRI pictures of the various speakers. Now some of them are obvious, this one is pretty obvious. That one, there is actually, there's something going on with the tongue, but it's a bit um, difficult. That one is very narrow. Um, this one does close down at the lips, it's hard to see or move. And op does have a round sort of shape vocal tract. When you speak, if you think about it, you are probably aware, or can be aware, of what's happening in here. You kind of know what your jaw's doing, you kind of know what your tongue's doing. But I don't think any of us know really what's going on down here, because we can't feel it. And the tongue is sitting here, and if you push it up to squeeze things, the tongue bulk has to do that. So if this is narrow, this is wide, and vice versa. If you want to open this for an R valve, the tongue goes down and pushes back, so this tube is narrow and that one's wide. But what we did is said, OK, we can synthesize these. And these are synthesized with plastic tubes, sorry, plastic blocks with holes in them, you're looking down on it, where the mouth end is there. We tried to recreate his shapes, and this is what we've ended up with. tracks, these are made of plastic. And they are also shapes which are a bit too regular. But we did a listening test. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that, shut up. 
Um, we deal with this test, and the confusion matrix says that when the R was sounded, the words are here just to get the vowel sound. 28 people heard them as R. A little bit of confusion with E and O and O, and the percentage corrector at the end. Yeah, so, so, what's going in? What's the input? You've just heard it. That was it. So you're asked to listen to those, I can't remember how many, a number of those, and say which ones they were, from a, from a table like this. So you have a random set, and your responses could be any of these the vowels and these words. So on the whole, people can do it. It's obviously synthesized, it's obviously plastic. So what does this mean in practice? Well, when we listen to sound that is speech, the important things are that there are patterns in the acoustic energy which allow us to distinguish one sound from another. And it's very specific for speech because those patterns have come from a tube with a buzzer in the end. And so we learn this very young. And I'm going to show a spectrogram. We've seen them already, so I probably don't understand about a spectrogram. Are you all familiar with spectrograms? Just in case there are any shaking heads. Um, frequencies here. Darkness of banding indicates the um, energy, that there's energy at that frequency, and time is on the x-axis. So, here are the spectrograms of those tubes, and here are spectrograms of an adult male speaking the same vowels. And you can see, just with a glance, that there are similarities. They're not exactly the same, but then if you've got me and another adult male to do this, we wouldn't be the same either. The brain learns the patterns. It does not learn the absolute frequencies, at least not the perception. Therefore, I can listen to a man, or a woman, or a child, and our vocal tracts are different sizes, so the acoustic patterns are in different places, and understand their speech. It's not about the absolute values, it's about the patterning between these so-called forms, these dark markings, which indicate something about the sounds. So here we have a little spectrogram for the word I, which in English starts with an R and goes to an E. If I do it slowly for you, I, I, I. And that's what happens. It's a pretty well a linear change from one shape to the other. And in terms of articulation, the articulators move approximately the same speed to get from one to the other. We all learned this when we were very young. We imitated most likely our parents and started to learn the patterns. And of course, we listened to them at the same time, so our brains would be presented with this information. Um, worth saying at this point, because one question might be, why? Why are we drawing these rather strange pictures? And the answer is, both your ears have cochleas in them, this curly snail thing you may have seen in biology or wherever at school, and the cochlea provides that analysis for your brain, and you've got two of them. So therefore, these patterns are critically important because we know that they are available to the brain via the two cochlea. And they're called forms. Right, so there is a spectrogram for some speech. It is the sentence, speech matters to you. And I'm not planning to go through the detail, but uh, um, it's not transcribed. No, so that's Matt, that's T, as T, to, where are we speech? Oh, speech matters to you. There's a U at the end. Anyway, that, that's um, the sort of thing that we, we can look at. Um, you'll notice that the S of speech tends to be high up in frequency, and that's where S belongs. So, here we have, has that saved me twice, right? Okay. No, it's because I'm going backwards, is it? No, it's not because I'm going backwards. Okay, that slides in twice, don't know why. So let me just think a bit about speech in poor acoustics, because this one always used to fascinate me, because I used to be at York for 25 years. And the sort of thing you get if you went to York Station would be something like this. <laughs> The acoustics of York Station are very interesting. See a picture up there. It's a very fine Victorian railway station. It's got a bend in it, and it's basically glass on top. Lots of reflection. It wasn't designed for performing music in, and neither was it designed for electronic amplification of people making announcements. And there was, when I first... So, we had a very classic rail announcer, 
but I think was a singer, because this is how she did it. She is the clearest person ever. She's, she's retired now, but when she used to make the announcements, you knew exactly what was going on. And that's, I think, the example I know of making the voice perceptual and understandable in really difficult acoustic situations. So let's just think for a moment in hearing. As I've said already, the cochlea is the thing that gives us the acoustic patterns. It does the acoustic analysis and it presents the brain all the time. As I talk to you now, both your cochleas are working. It's an analog system and it's sending your brain impulses which describe what in effect is the spectrogram in real time as I'm speaking and hopefully you can understand it. But of course they're also picking up anything else in the room. Cars going by, jets going over. All of it is acoustic. But basically it is a pattern. We've seen that one already. This is um, actually, I don't know if you recognise, that's me. Now that's me a very long time ago, because this was part of my PhD, which, as you might gather by looking at me, was a rather while ago. And what we were doing was looking at the importance of pitch in perception. And the issue with that was, because in 1981, which is when this was done, we were working on cochlear implant hearing aids. And in those days, there weren't multi-channel implants as there are now, they didn't exist then. And what we were doing was a single channel electrode which sat on the round window in the ear for people who had no middle ear. So they'd, all, they'd had an accident, the middle ear had been completely removed, and this was a way of trying to connect with electrodes to the outside world. So we mocked up in a studio, I'm going to be reading something, you won't hear it. The voice you will hear is Stuart Rosen trying to interpret what he sees as he looks at me. At 20 to 4, he, it dawned on him for one, for once, for one. Wait, what? What? Da, ta, what? For what felt like the first time that he had been. So, not easy. So what we then did is we added a pitch signal. So this is me, you'll see I'm wearing a, a neck collar. Underneath that collar are two little electrodes that sit either side, it's called an electrode or a ringograph, and it monitors vocal cord vibration electrically. So it, you'll hear it now. It's a buzz. But it's a buzz at my voice pitch, so it's an audio signal, exactly the same experiment, and this is what it looks and sounds like. Again, as if for the first time. He started worrying. He started wondering about the imminent tea party. The imminent tea party. Was the Colonel, in fact, the strange man that so many people so obviously thought he was? I have to say, I don't know where Stuart got these texts from. But anyway, <laughs> you can probably see from that how important voice pitch is. And it turned out that if you just do this with normally hearing people, for English, the increase in communication rate is around about 85%, just by adding pitch to no pitch. And if you do it in Cantonese, where pitch gives you meaning on words, it's over 250%. And that was the raison d'etre for doing this in those days because uh, my supervisor is the guy that invented the ringograph, and so that's why we were doing this. But what it highlighted to me is the importance of the elements of the speech signal, in this case, pitch. The vital importance of that as the excitation signal for speech, because that's basically what the larynx is doing. It's putting that buzz in. You then manipulate the tube on top in time with the buzz, appropriately, and you get speech. 
The other thing I find fascinating there is that word eminent and imminent. He got it first time. Um, you know, when I changed it, he got it first time. He would, we'd never have done that without the electrodes on. We would have stayed there for ages trying to sort that out. So let's think about, so uh, that was the pitch one. And the key thing is that the pitch is carried in the low frequency part of the spectrum. And just because it's here, historically, the lady in the picture, this is the day she first was connected up to a clearing part. And I have the presence of mind to take a camera. That's the only picture we've got of the day she was connected up. She'd never heard anything at all. We connected her up, and there was this wonderful um, new world of some strange buzz she was hearing. And of course, you don't know what she was hearing because an electrode with a signal on it stuck into the outside of the ear, you can't simulate what that's going to do in terms of the transmission of sound. And it obviously, it's something, but it's hard to know exactly what it was doing. I'm going to move on to the other half of the title, The Voice of Sound. And in this, it's thinking now about the importance of patterns, which I've just talked about. And we've already heard today about the importance of pattern perception. The brain is a pattern perception machine. Our machine's probably a bit cruel. Engine. We look at visual patterns, we do smell patterns, we do touch patterns, we do acoustic patterns. For example, in speech, as I've already said, you get the vocal track size from the pattern and it will tell you whether you're listening to a, a child or an adult. You get the pitch and that will tell you more about child or adult. So here's a singer. Have a listen and see what you think is going on. Actually, um, you're bang on, actually. It's, it's actually an electronic castrato that I did for a television program some years ago. Um, it is a boy, but it's a boy with a man's vocal tract. So it sounds a bit ethereal, because it's not a sound that anyone can create, unless we believe that's what a castrato was, which you can pick that up. Um, it could have been a female singer. It could have been a boy treble. It's not high castrato music. It's in the right range. And just to put something very curious on it, for me personally, that's actually my son was the treble at the time, and I sang the tenor part, and I morphed our two voices together. And in fact, for the television programme, I did three tenors and three trebles, and a collection of morphs produced the final thing. But that one has never been heard in public. So we're the first people to hear it. But I thought it was relevant, because we're dealing here with the voice of sound. So, acoustic patterns are the key thing. Here are some acoustic patterns. Which one is Jan Ravens and which one is Charlotte Green? <clears throat> there was once a young rat named Arthur. There was once a young rat named Arthur. Which one's the original? What's the second one? Bottom one? Yeah, it is actually the bottom one. <laughs> the person doing here the, um, the copying, um, what's the word? Impersonation. Impersonation, thank you. Brain's gone. The person doing the impersonation has done a completely different pitch pattern. So it's not a direct copy because she didn't hear the original. And we put these up. Now, what I think is happening here is that the patterns are a clue. The people who do impersonations cannot turn their vocal tract into somebody else's vocal tract. They can't because the bone structure's wrong, the soft tissue structure's wrong. So what are they doing? But what I think they're doing is that they are constructing formant patterns which match the other person. And I think this is evidence to suggest how important the formant patterns are. Because it takes away the need to get the whole 
of the spectrum right, because you can't do that. Now, I've also had some time working with Rory Bremner on one of the television programmes where they said, improve his um, impersonation of Tony Blair. This was on a television programme. They gave me a quarter of an hour to work with him. And what I discovered when I put a spectrogram up was that his consonants were not very loud compared with the low frequencies. So I said to him, look, Tony Blair's upper frequencies are much louder. And he said to me this, and I'm probably giving away a trade secret here. He said, yes, David, there's a reason for that. I haven't got the right teeth in. I said, what do you mean, you've got the right teeth in? He says, no, when I'm on stage, and I wasn't expecting to do this for this programme, I've got pockets full of teeth. And I put in different teeth for different people. And then my tongue interacts with a different shape in here, and that characterises the consonants. So there's a trick that's being used to make it sound right, but I think it's all linked with this idea. There was once a young no, no, we had that. <laughs> so, uh, let's have a listen to this. This is a sentence. They're buying some bread. Okay, now, if I'm true about performance being important... They're buying some bread. And I'll play you this. They're buying some bread. They're buying some bread. Do you hear the sentence in that? That is a sinusoidal, three sine waves, tracking the format patterns. That's all it is. That is very strong evidence, clearly, that the format patterns are crucially important to speech. So let's see how good you are at that. They're buying some bread. You can shut up. So here we are. Here is another one. It's up with the Another go? It's up with the knife. Anyone got it? Something to like. Cut with a knife. Did that get Who mentioned the knife? Yeah, that's exactly right. She cut with a knife. Okay, we get two more goes of this. Where were you a year ago? <laughs> Where were you a year ago? Hold on. Where were you a year ago? Pitch is a bit different. Well, there's no pitch in the other one. My dog bingo! My dog Bingo ran around the wall. Okay, but you can see that it is possible to communicate that way, but it sounds very peculiar. As a speech coding system, that would be fantastic, because the amount of information you need to drive three sine waves is completely minimal. But I don't think it's ever been used for that. Okay. Georgie, Georgie, put the pie. Kiss the girls and then they can cry. Okay, it's a budgerigar. And interestingly, what budgerigars are doing, they have syrinxes. I think they have two syrinxes, if I'm not right. And they track the lower two formats. So they're doing much the same as we just saw. Georgie, Georgie! And what's this doing? Who's this? <coughs> Who do you think that is? How would you describe that? Have it again. And what would you say about the person that made the sound? Irish. Man? Irish. Irish. Okay. Remember I'm talking about patterns here, right? This is what it actually is. This is a talking seal. <laughs> In America, that can talk, hence the big splash. The vocabulary is not great, but talking seal. There is also, I have not recorded this because it's not, it's not available. I saw in a conference last year a talking elephant. And the talking elephant was incredible. Talking Korean, but even I can tell you know nothing about Korean that we were listening to speech. And has anyone any idea how an elephant might talk? An elephant's tongue is flat. It hasn't got a bulky tongue. Uh, and I like to do the old joke like this. You can do the old joke, but you're wrong. <laughs> what it actually did was this. It put its trunk in its mouth and manipulated the end of the, the trunk to change the acoustics inside. Mm. But there we go. Um, right. Musik und Sprache. Musik und Sprache. That's the spectrogram of the, the spoken musical of Sprach. That's the spectrogram of the other one. 
which is a full orchestra playing the speech. So this was scored, the piccolo kind of went <coughs> and the double bass did other things. So that was synthesized with an orchestra. Um, extraordinary. And moving on to um, this one. Not to that one, let's go to this one. Now this one's been very difficult to try and find a recording for this, but remember I'm looking at the voice of sound. How many of you have heard of the notion that if you are in a house on your own and you hear a sound and the brain triggers to think there's something upstairs and there shouldn't be? Have you ever had that experience or seen it? It's something they do in horror films. But it happens actually in one's own house sometimes. You'd be downstairs thinking I'm on my own in the house and suddenly there's a sound. And the sound sounds like speech. And that of course is alarming. That, that will trigger the fight flight and everything else and the hairs go up and Oh my god, how do they get up there? The interesting thing about that, and I've tried to find a recording, this one isn't very good, this is of a creaking door, is that I think what's going on there is that it is triggering those very same formant patterns for sufficient time for the brain to switch into speech mode and say, I think that's speech, and therefore trigger all the other modes. So that's a kind of curious one, that, where natural phenomena are matching the um, sound of speech. Now then, what happens in the frenzied world? I'm sure it's Google. Do you know what this is? Shy, shy, shy. Google? I'm sure it's Google. Shut him up. This is the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire thing from some years ago. Do you remember that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire trial? Major Ingram got a million pounds, and then he went on trial because of the coughs, which allegedly were giving him the answers. Mm -hmm. I was one of the defence team for this, there were three of us working on this. In the end, it nearly went to court, but he backed out the night before, so we never went to court. <coughs> and the reason for mentioning... Exactly, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> the reason I put it up was that this is the voice of a sound trying to communicate information. And the question is, was it actually doing that? So just to give you some idea about the forensic world, if you get into forensic acoustics, you get a solicitor who comes and says, right, can you demonstrate in this case that the 29 costs that the prosecution alleged were giving him the information, he couldn't hear them. And therefore it's all low bunk. And solicitors don't want to know it's 20 dB above this or 3 dB below that. So he did some analysis from a microphone on his um, lapel and came up with the answer where you can say that he couldn't hear the coughs, only if you could say he couldn't hear the question from Chris Tarrant, because the levels were within 1 dB of each other on average. So they then came back and they said, could we prove that there were so many coughs in this programme that those 29 would have been lost amongst a sea of coughs? So we went back and spent ages. It was a 90-minute programme analysing and recording coughs. And we found 297th in my brain. So as we prayed, the sisters are saying, fantastic, 10 to 1, we got them, we got them. We said, whoa, 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 whoa. At the moment when he went through each of the answers and the cough came after one of them, there was only one extra cough, and it was clearly female. So in the end, he pleaded guilty. Anyway, I just thought I'd put that there because that's another bit of communication where um, the sound is giving information. It's from parts. It's been done already. This man, Von Hemplin, invented this machine. This is in 1793. And this machine was his speaking machine. I didn't bring it with me because it's a bit fragile on the train. It's got a bellows here. It's got a reed inside and a leather bag that you can squeeze to make sort of vowel sounds. It's not very good, but it is 1790. It, I believe, is the first mechanical speech machine. And I've always had a fascination for that, and it kind of fits with what I'm doing now, somebody mentioned before I came on, is looking at MRIs of speakers. So here is an MRI set of pictures, which goes from one side of the head coming out towards you. It's about to go again. The black is the airway. There it is. That's the middle. These are the lips. That's the larynx. There's the spine. And from that, you can recreate the shape of the vocal tracts. So you can take this picture, you can find its airway, it's in red in this picture, and you can recreate the vocal tract, or at least the airway. You can then take that airway, put a sheet around it, and 3D print it. And what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. These are 3D vocal tracts which have been printed, they're mine, the lips are on the front, so they fit there. 
they're the right size, they're life size, these are my lips. Uh, that's the vowel R, this is the vowel O, I think. Um, and they are, uh, I, I'm happy to pass them around, but these are brittle. And yes, they will snap. Please don't test them. But by all means, look at it. If it has a pimple on the outside, it has a pimple on the inside, because these are printed constant thickness. And what I'm hoping to be able to do is just to give you a quick example of what they sound like. So this is what they look like on the machine. The pair of loudspeakers, tracks on top, the head is just there for the picture. A bit of electronics to be the larynx, you need some sort of larynx. And I've called it the vocal tract organ, as it said at the beginning. This is what it's doing, it's doing the larynx source from in here and the vocal tract on top. And this little video will play a short bit of a four-part piece where two of the parts are human singing parts, the vocalese piece, and two of them are the vocal tract organ. And the camera goes into the vowels on the desk, we'll see what happens as it goes in. Uh. French and continental organs. And my one ambition is to try and get a true vox humana into organs. So I have an ambition to turn this into a chamber organ and take it on tour if I can find something to compose on some music. So if there are any budding composers who would like to compose for a box of plastic tubes, please talk to me afterwards. Okay. Um, here's another one. This one's rather sad of this. I'm just going to take you through another bit of forensics, but this is a voice whose sound is on a cockpit voice recorder. It's not a nasty one. Um, it's not one when they actually are still recording as they crash until about that minute. This is what happened. It's back in 1987. They were flying from Taipei to Johannesburg, and they disappeared off the radar here. This was a Boeing 747 Combi aircraft. That's the one with a jumbo jet. But there's a, um, halfway down the cabin, there was passengers, there were passengers in the front end and cargo in the back end, so it's called combi. That is the so-called black box, notice it's painted orange, just to confuse everybody, let's see if you can find it. That's the condition it was in when it was dug up from the bottom of the uh, ocean. Notice this is an analog tape recorder that's being thrown around in an aeroplane. This is what the spectrogram looks like for parts of the speech. You can make up a few harmonics of speech, but absolutely nothing else. And this is what it sounded like. Now then, our job was to transcribe, it's about one minute of the speech in the cockpit. And let me just play the tape on this anything about it. You will hear a bell goes off, and then you should really hear people talking. And you imagine you have to write this down. Anyway, this is what the transcription said. No, no, no. I'm not expecting to read it necessarily. That's what we produced. It then got sent to South Africa, who'd done their own transcription with their own expert, 
and the lawyers then put them side by side, and one word was different, and it was and, I think. It was either and or the. So everyone was happy, and they went on and sorted out the thing. So that was a salutary sound of the voice. Everybody was killed. 119 people lost their lives in this thing, and even sadder. That fire alarm went off. The cockpit voice recorder stopped one minute later. The plane hit the sea 19 minutes after that. So goodness knows what happened inside the aircraft. There we go. But I just wanted to play it, because if you've never heard that sort of thing, that is, in this situation, the kind of thing people deal with to try and unpick from a vocal or something what actually went on. So we're nearly at the end. And I just want to play you this. I think perhaps it's all magic. <laughs> Okay, what's the tune? It's, yes, it's Harry Potter's the Hedwig theme. What's the instrument? With or without an H? Well done. It's the glass harmonica. You heard the glass harmonica? This is a very curious story, and you know how sometimes you come to speak and your paper fits with something we heard this morning. We had a paper this morning talking about bedlam. You may not know the connection yet, but let me tell you about the glass harmonica. No, no, we don't want that. Um, so the glass harmonica, yes, right, it started life with a box of glasses, and Benjamin Franklin heard this. Benjamin Franklin was one of the revolutionaries in America, who pioneered science in America, lived in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia Science Museum is named after him. He heard this instrument, and he decided this is not the way to do it. He was really keen on it, he wanted to improve his playability, particularly wanted to play chords. Now you've got to have huge fingers <coughs> to play chords on wine glasses standing up in the thing. So being an engineer, oh, and he wants to play long notes. Being an engineer, he stacked his glasses inside each other. Each had a hole connected to a rotating rod, so that each glass was then made for each note. And you didn't need any water, so the thing didn't go out of tune due to humidity and evaporation. Marvel's instrument, there it is, that's a picture from the museum. The glasses are now stacked along there, and it's got a treble pedal underneath. So, you control that with the pedal, there it is. And there is a, an actor with Benjamin Franklin's sleeves playing. <laughs> so this is what it was all about. He used the word harmonica because it's the Italian for harmony. You can play many notes because they're close together. He had 48 notes with little c in the middle, so he had lots of scope. It was pre-tuned during manufacture, and there were no water levels to check for tuning. And he wrote to an Italian friend the following, the advantages are that its tones are incomparably sweet beyond those of any other. The tones may be swelled and softened, and the tones can be any length. You don't need to tune it. His wife said that, she was convinced she'd gone to heaven, and was listening to the music of the angels, when it's about voice and sound. Turns out this thing had a special frequency range in which it worked. Most of its energy was in the 1 to 4 kilohertz range. It was said it was difficult for people to place that sound. So location in that frequency band was difficult. This is something people complained of. So it wasn't clear where the music was coming from. It is reported that players and listeners, quotes, lost their wits, end quotes. It might have been due to this. Lead crystal was used and machined. So there was lead in the machine shop and possibly on the fingers of the player, but not for the audience. And the frequency range, we'll just quickly stop and look at the frequency range. Um, oh no, 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 that's fine. Okay, so he had a harmonica, it was invented for that, it was popular across Europe. There were huge numbers of public concerts until. It sound reputedly made people go mad, and local equivalent of local councils, local authorities, banned it and had all the instruments destroyed. That is why there are no glass harmonicas pretty well in Europe. There are one in our well. store. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Store. I, there's one at the science museum. There's one at the science museum, right. Good. And there's one in the Benjamin Franklin House in Trafalgar Square. I'd like to come and see the one in the Science Museum. But there are very few others, and most of them... Is that an original? Uh, Was it a replica? Had it since about the 1860s. Oh, it probably is then. Is then. But most of them have gone. Um, and I wanted to put this in because this 
said something about what sound can do as a kind of voice. It's a different sort of voice, it's sort of ethereal voice. But it clearly had effect on people, which was well documented to the extent that that instrument was thrown away and banned. And I'd like to add, this is my coda. Okay, so this is, I think, the real voice yes. of sound. Have a listen to this. I'll play it again. Did you get did you get it? <laughs> Anyone know what that is? Is it applause? Is it a what? Applause. Applause? Yeah. Oh, is it applause? It'd be applause. Yeah. It's not actually. The way you find out what it is is to make a spectrogram. This is the spectrogram. <laughs> this is the spectrogram. <laughs> this is doing writing with a spectrogram. <laughs> And on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it.